as usual, when you start to talk, you start thanking the organizers for inviting you and for organizing so nice a meeting. And I'm doing so. Thank you. But I also thank you particularly for the schedule, since during the first two talks this morning, I was happy to see that there were, they mentioned actually there were on uh, transducers, there were weighted automata, there were monadic second order logic, and more or less complicated, sorry, uh, fragments of some logic, and there were other carriage traces, and of course words. And if you pay attention, then you will find all these popping up in my talk uh, as well, but only in, uh, in more or less in passing. But all the theory I'm going to explain is somehow based on the findings of, of that kind. So I'm going to speak about the theory of the subword order. So just to remind all of us, uh, U is a subword of V. If U results from V by dropping some of the letters, and then we write it with this uh, less than or equal sign, and the other way around, V is a superword of U. Uh, here are some examples. V square A, V square is a subword of this word that I won't read, since you can from that word drop the cost out letters and you end up with the left one. And the, any word is a subword of itself. You just do not drop anything. And the empty word, if you drop everything, is the subword of everything, so of every word. So it's the least word. And why should we talk about these, this subword relation? Well, it has some relevance. Uh, it has been used in terminal writing, since it's a special form of lexicographic path, or so to prove some. Uh, termination properties, or you can use it in the verification of lossy channel systems and uh, the like. And I would be surprised if you would not have heard about that. Uh, I did, here's just the basic, the first levels of the subword order. I already mentioned that the empty word is the very least one, and then you have two words, but the alphabet here is finally A. Uh, then you have two on the uh, second level, and on the third level, and that's what I wanted to stress here, you have, for instance, A, B, and that's above A and above B, but the same holds for B, A. So you do not have a lattice, uh, despite the fact that any two words have a common upper bound. Actually, every finite set of words has a common uh, upper bound, but it's not a lattice, it's not a semi-lattice. Uh, what is known is that it's a value quality order, and that's the basic for its use in verification. Uh, and uh, value quality order means, in particular, you do not have infinite uh, anti chains, but they can be arbitrarily long. Just look at any level. Of course, two words of the same length cannot be subword of each other, and you have arbitrarily many words of the same length. Just choose the length large enough. Now, the general question I'm asking, what classes of properties are decidable about the subword order? And uh, as usual, as very often when I give talks, this means I consider the relational structure. And this relational structure has the universe set of all words over the fixed alphabet A. I have the binary subword relation in the structure. And then I have a constant for each and every word. So formulas can refer to particular words. And I also have a, a predi a regu regular predicates, unary predicates. You can say there is a word x in the language, su su uh, this and that language, such that blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So universe, binary re uh, subword relation, infinitely many constants, and regular predicates, all regular predicates. And then. I want to make uh, statements about this structure. And of course, I consider first order logic. I have the ability to say x is a subword of y, where x and y both can be variables or constants. They can both be uh, constants and it can be mixed. I can say x belongs to k. Then I have Boolean combinations. And you can 
extend the list as usual, and I have existential and universal quantification over single elements. So it's classical first order logic about this structure. But as it turned out, uh, will turn out, first order logic is far too powerful. I have to restrict it, and uh, therefore I'm now defining some fragments and then later some extensions. So a couple of logics here on the right hand side. First, sigma one, as usual, the existential fragment, all the formulas in prenex normal form that only use the existential quantifier. Sigma two, prenex normal form, couple of existential quantifiers, followed by a couple of universal quantifiers, and that's it. Then I uh, introduce the logic FO plus mod. Here I add another type of quantifier, quantifiers that allows me to say there is, say, an even number of nodes of this, uh, having this and that property. And not, well, even is just the simplest example. P modulo Q and P and Q are constants there, natural numbers. Um, I also introduce FOK, where K is a natural number. And this is all of first order logic, but you only have the variables x1 to xk. You cannot use more variables. And this makes it very hard to say there are k plus 1 many nodes with this and that property. In some uh, situations, this is possible, but this is, these are only very, very special situations. For instance, on a linear order, that's all clear. You can do that with, with two fingers pointing at the nodes. Uh, but in general, you can't. So we lose quite a lot by restricting the quantifiers to, uh, sorry, the variables to just k many. That can be reused, but we only have these names. And to make up for this loss of expressivity, we add another quantifier, a, a threshold counting quantifier. I allow to say there are at least n many nodes with one property. So you only need one variable, but it will be instantiated, say, n times, and the same property will ch be checked for all of them. The list isn't finished yet. We have C plus mod Q, a K, sorry. And now you know the um, recipe. We have K variable names. We have threshold counting quantifiers. That's why we have the C here. And we have modulo counting uh, quantifiers. That's why we call it uh, mod K. So sigma 1, sigma 2, the usual quantifier alternation uh, fragments, FO plus mod bounded number of, quanti uh, of variables, threshold counting quantifiers, and then mixtures of all this. What is known? So first result, the sigma 1 theory of the partial order alone is decidable. So I drop the constants. The formula cannot uh, mention the constants. It cannot mention the regular predicates. It's just the partial order. So this is admittedly a weak result. Karen Dicker and Schneeberlon showed uh, that the FO2 theory is decidable even in the presence of regular predicates. So two variable names. You can alternate quantifiers as you wish, but you have only two names. These are the positive results, and then Despite looking weak, it turns out that they, they are close to undecidability, since here sigma 1 theory of the order alone was decidable. But if you allow constants in your formulas, you get undecidability. And constants, of course, are a special case of regular predicates. Just use unirregular uh, languages. Uh, so this is undecidable. And if you go from sigma 1 to sigma 2, the order alone gives an undecidable theory. So this is really kind of the maximal thing you can hope for. And here, FO2 theory, two variable names, is decidable. If you allow a third one, you get undecidability, even without any, call it syntactic sugar, constants and regular predicates. So the subword order that we are all more or less familiar with 
has complicated th uh, properties. It's complicated to determine these properties. Um, what we tried to do with Georg Setsche, and we succeeded to some extent, was to restrict, uh, to uh, investigate what happens if we restrict the universe. We do not allow all the words, but only the words from one particular language. And of course, let's make it trivial. No, not as trivial as uh, a finite language, uh, but say uh, a language that's just a chain. One letter iterated. Then you have the natural numbers, and it's not trivial, but uh, we all know what's happening. So if we have a more complicated language, what is happening then? And I will present two constrac uh, con uh, cresting results and two generalizations of these four. And I could ask now where you expect a generalization and where you expect a contrasting result. I'll make this clear in the talk. So let's first consider the theory of a language with a subword order and, and all regular predicates. Then our result, our basic result is the following. If the uh, language L is context-free and bounded, and bounded means a couple of copies of W1 and then a couple of copies of W2, etc., for a fixed sequence of K words. So such a context-free language. In that case, the strongest logic I considered here, no, not the FO plus mod theory, sorry, uh, becomes decidable. Uh, and the proof strategy is as uh, follows. Uh, we will do a first order interpretation in Pressburger arithmetic. So we will translate a formula talking about this subword order into a formula talking about uh, tuples of natural numbers and using addition only. And uh, phrased differently, what I need is a function that associates a word with every k tuple of natural numbers such that at least all the words from the language can appear that way, belong to the image of this function g. And not only this, but in addition, I need formulas that express a property of a tuple of natural numbers. Which property shall this be? The property that the image under G belongs to the language K for every regular uh, language K. And uh, sorry, also for the language L. And then, of course, we also need uh, the corresponding result, a formula in Pressburger arithmetic with uh, two uh, free tuples of variables expressing that the images are subwords of each other. Now, we need these formulas. Not really, since we know that definable in Pressburger arithmetic is the same as semilinear. What we need is that certain sets are semilinear, namely, if you take the function g and take the pre-image of the language k, then this shall be a, a semilinear set, and the same shall hold for the subword order. If we have this, then uh, we get decidability. Now, uh, there's essentially only one idea for a function g in this context. You take a k tuple of natural numbers, and this gives you the powers of w1, 2, etc. that will result in the word. So I couldn't make up any other idea, sensible ones. Uh, I'm sorry, we will also need a couple of other uh, functions here. First, an alphabet that has k elements, gamma 1 to gamma k, and then a monoid homomorphism that takes, a, sorry, that work, uh, maps from gamma star to a star, and it takes the letter gamma i and maps it to the word wi up here. Yeah. So it's, in a sense, very similar to, to this mapping, but now from one free monoid into the other. And then uh, Parix monoid homomorphism that counts the number of occurrences of a letter, and we needed 
uh, on gamma star. Now, so here we have the functions again. That's a star. Here we have the k-tuples of natural numbers. Then we had the gamma star. And, well, here is g that maps m to w1 to the m1, etc. We have here the mapping f that maps gamma i to wi, monoid homomorphism. Here we have an identity. This is not a monoid, just a language. And here we will use the per, uh, peric image. And that's why it's not up, the answer is not uh, immediately clear to me, since we do not use the um, peric image there, but at a very different position. It, it doesn't matter. It, it might still be, uh, be possible. Now, the first thing I wanted to prove that if k is context-free, then the pre-image of k under g is effectively semi-linear. And here is essentially the proof. k lives in A star, and it's context-free. If it's context-free there, and here we have a monoid homomorphism, then its pre-image, called k1 here, is effectively context-free. Now, here I have the identity, and of course, if, uh, if I want to move k1 here, I will take the intersection, and therefore it's important that this language is regular, and we all know intersection of a regular and context-free language is uh, context-free, and that's k2. And now I can apply uh, the Parik image and get that psi of k2 is... Uh, effectively semi-linear, and what I did was I moved k on this way over here. And having done that, I check that this is precisely the set I was interested in. This is precisely g inverse of k, the pre-image of k, and we are done. This is for each and every uh, context-free language. Now, we wanted to have a similar property for the subword order. Subword order doesn't live in A star, but in A star squared. So we have to square each and every object in, uh, in this diagram. And then the claim is more or less the same. Uh, if you start with the um, subword order here and you move it back here, you get an effectively semilinear set. Uh, and why is that the case? You start here again, and you use that the subword order is rational. If this is rational, then its pre-image under a homomorphism is rational. The same here with, yeah, intersection with a rational relation wouldn't work, but this is not a rational relation. Not only a rational relation, it's a direct product of two regular languages, and therefore you can do this intersection here, and then you use peric image, and you get a rational, or in other words, semilinear set up there, and therefore and then you prove that this is really what you wanted to have. So, essentially the same uh, uh, proof, but two-dimensional. So, what we get is, for any words w1 to k, and any context-free language that's bounded, the FO plus mod theory with regular predicates is decidable, and not only decidable, but even in elementary time. And... Uh, the proof is as follows. The two claims that I just sketched uh, provide a first-order interpretation of the structure we are interested in in the natural numbers with addition. And that allows you to translate any FO plus mod formula that talks about L into an FO plus mod formula that talks about the natural numbers. And this is a dangerous moment since we all, I guess most of you, remember, yeah, in Pressburger arithmetic, I can easily say a number is even by just saying there is something such that doubling it gives the original one. But that's not the mod we use here. The mod we use here is there's an even number of witnesses for some property. It's a completely different concept. So this is extremely difficult. No, it's not, uh, and we were uh, able to uh, prove together with uh, Peter Habermehl that also this FO plus mod theory is decidable and the complexity doesn't increase. So it's the same complexity as for Pressburger arithmetic. This was the first result. We have 
the, the results on A star. And here we had the undecidability for small fragments of first order logic. And if the language is extremely nice, bounded and context free, then you can even add the regular predicates, you can even add modulo counting quantifiers and get decidability. Clearly, a result that I would classify as construct, uh, contrasting. Uh, is it the case that you're saying that the uh, first order theory of uh, uh, actual numbers with uh, us is decided by algorithm? But are you saying that uh, the specific kinds of effort is not uh, sentences that you're getting under the interpretation that you have, is that uh, uh, is the specific sub theory of the effort is not theory of actual numbers plus? The plus is that precisely? Yeah. Or, but what about the general effort is not theory of the general effort is not theory of the natural numbers plus the plus? Is that precious? Natural numbers with addition? Yeah. Yeah, that's precisely what I. Oh. Yeah, is it? Is this, uh, I was just wondering whether it is a specific sub theory of it. This is okay under the interpretation that we have. This is decided on. No, it's, it's decidable in general. So it was the result completely independent. We didn't know anything about a separate order at that time, which is not quite true, but we didn't think about it at that moment. Now, it, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to generalize this result here, uh, where I will consider an arbitrary regular language for A star. So the sigma-1 theory of a, regular, of a language L under a separate order, and the theorem, as I said, if L is regular, then the sigma-1 theory is, uh, of the order alone, is decidable. And the proof idea, we distinguish two cases. The language L could be bounded. Regular and bounded, well, then it's context-free and bounded, then the whole first-order theory is decidable, even with modulo. So this is done. The second case, the language is not bounded, but still regular. Then I only want to decide the first-order theory. Eh, sorry, the existential theory. So I have a statement of the form. There are five nodes that are ordered like this or like that, or like that. That's the formula. And of course, this disjunction can be taken out, so all you need is to be able to say, to check whether a particular partial, finite partial order embeds into the um, order at hand. That, that's all that's needed to be decided. And in order to prove it, we had to find some results that we didn't find in the literature. And the first one is, if L is regular, then there are words W, Z, V, and X. They are non-empty. V and Z have the same length. And W, Z, V star, X is a subset of L. Actually, this is a moment. Yeah. Uh, where I have to tell you something, it just occurs to me. Uh, some 15, 20 years ago or so, I worked together with him who shall not be named in this occasion. And I learned a lot from this cooperation. And one thing, and I'm telling it my students regularly, one thing I learned was first make a proof that's important, and then go over it again and think about the names of variables. The first things should be small letters and then they should increase. Never say, let n be a natural number, then there is a natural number m, since that's before it in the uh, alphabet. So, there are words x, u, v, and w. u and v have the same length and x, u, v, star, y is a subset of L. And this is not new, this, this is known, now that I have deciphered it. And the word u, v is primitive. So it says every 
autom finite automaton, deterministic finite automaton, has a state with two loops, distinct loops, and if you go through both of them, then you get a primitive word. Okay, that's one thing. And why do we need this primitive loop? Um, so let n be large enough. P is some natural number, your favorite one, and then make n length of this primitive word plus p plus 3. If you do so, then you have a certain embedding of partial orders. This is the p-dimensional cube, the 0, 1 um, vectors of length n ordered component-wise, p-dimensional cube. And this here is the subword order. And what is the language? You have p copies of, yeah, of n copies of uv, of the primitive word. So a primitive word copied a lot. And you prefix this either with epsilon or with v. Of course, epsilon stands for 0, v stands for 1. And since you have p many zeros and ones, you repeat this word p times. And then it is bloody obvious that the obvious mapping from here, from the cube into this language, is order preserving. What is complicated is the other way around. That if you take two vectors and map them in the obvious way, then you do not map in incomparable ones to comparable ones. And that's where we need primitivity and we also need uh, that many iterations here. And, and the whole proof is purely word combinatoric. And we learned today that the combinatorics in, on words are sometimes too complicated. You shouldn't uh, go into the details there. Uh, at least I use this as, as an excuse. Now, this language here, embed, ordered by the subword order, embeds trivially into L, since any of the words here uh, belongs to u v star, and you prefix it with x, and you suffix it with y, and this is, of course, then an embedding. So that's, that's clear. And now all finite partial orders embed into L. I only embedded the p-dimensional cube, but just a second. Uh, but of course, if you now come across uh, finite partial orders with p elements, say, then you can embed it into the cube and the cube into the language. And that's the end of the proof. Anka. Maybe I missed something, but L is on one letter only. So the alphabet is unary. If the alphabet is unary, uh, yes, that's the that's case I missed out. But if L is unary, uh, sorry, if the alphabet is unary. So then it's not true that you find the A. Yeah, yeah. But the result still holds since the, linear, the partial order, regular infinite language, is the natural numbers. You are right, I should have at some point said that an alphabet is a, at least two elements. It's not bounded. It's not bounded. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, well, the, yeah, you're right. But Anka was stressing this. Okay, yeah. yeah. So the theorem is correct and the case distinction has to be taken with care. Yeah. Now, if L is regular, then the sigma 1 theory of this language L is decidable since you can decide whether a given partial or finite partial order embeds. Actually, every does. Now, the sigma 1 theory of a language together with constants I go back, looks like this, a star, subword, and constants, and in general, with the whole universe, it's undecidable, and I don't know how to generalize that. Uh, so let's consider very particular languages. Uh, let L be regular with the following property. If you have a pumpable word, so x, u star, v, y is a subset of L. 
if you have a loop in the uh, automaton, then this loop contains each and every letter. Every loop in the automaton contains every letter. No? That's, that's the property. And then we can prove that the sigma-1 theory is decidable. Of course, this is not true for uh, A star, uh, since you have just one state and you loop with very short loops. Uh, but if L is uh, nice, then you get decidability. And the proof idea is, well, very similar to the previous one. If you make a case distinction, either L is bounded or it's not bounded. If it's bounded, well, we have settled that case once forever. Uh, constants can be considered as unary, uh, as, as singleton regular languages. So that's okay. Now, what, is L, what if L is not bounded, then we need some technical results. The first one is any sigma-1 sentence, any existential sentence is equivalent over this structure to a disjunction over a block of existential quantifiers, conjunction, and then some statements that xi is above wi and psi doesn't contain quantifiers or constants. There, there is one type of, min of uh, atomic formulas missing, namely x is below w. We all can only say x is above w in these formulas. And that's the main thing here. Yeah? Uh, we have here only statements x is a supervert of w, and we can, uh, it's also not allowed to um, negate them, or not necessary, let's put it that way. And uh, this normal form only works under this severe restriction on the language. It doesn't hold in general. Having proved this, we show that if P is a finite partial order and W any word, then this partial order embeds into our partial order above W. And that means uh, take W to be the concatenation of all the words Wi, then you find P above them, and of course this means that all the nodes of the image of P are above Wi. So that's all you have to do. And again, also in this fi uh, second step, you need the particular property of uh, the regular language. It doesn't hold in general for all regular languages. Now, here, if uh, the universe is all words, then this theory, sigma-1 theory with constants is undecidable. If it is a regular language with, we call it frequent letters, then since, well, whenever you see an A, then in a finite distance you will see another A, or you are close to the end of the word. Uh, then if you have such a regular language, then the theory becomes uh, decidable. There's one cell em still empty. The FO2 theory with regular predicates is uh, decidable. I want to generalize this, and I have no hope to add a new uh, variable since that would give undecidability. I even consider C plus mod, so I have these fancy um, quantifiers, but only two variable names. So variables x and y, all the quantifiers I ever mentioned uh, in this talk, uh, threshold counting and modulo counting. And then uh, the theorem says that the C plus mod theo two theory with regular predicates has effective quantifier elimination. So, the first remark, uh, so far the new results were always talking about some language L here. Now I'm going to the general case again, but that's not really a restriction since you could just restrict every quantifier to the language L. If L is regular, then that's a predicate, and therefore you could also put here any regular language. So, 
to make it simple, we use the full um, universe. Ah, and effective quantifier elimination just says you can rewrite each and every formula into an equivalent one that doesn't have any quantifiers. Unfortunately, this quantifier elimination procedure uh, is non-elementary, but it immediately gives decidability. If you have a quantifier-free formula, then it mentions only constants, and of course you can decide whether this word is a subword of that word. So you get decidability, but it's not particularly fast. Proof idea. Well, quantifier elimination, as usual, by induct structural induction over the formula, and there's not much to be said if you have a disjunction or an atomic formula. The crucial step is if you have a formula that starts with a quantifier, and I use this Q here since I have these uh, fancy quantifiers, uh, and Psi is a Boolean combination. And here it uh, is important that we have only two variables, X and Y. So Psi mentions at most X and Y, and therefore that you can only have the formulas X below Y, Y below X, X is in a regular language, or Y is in a regular language. These are the only four types that can appear in the Boolean combination. So we have this formula phi. Let's, let's go back one slide. It was a quantifier followed by a Boolean combination. Now, this is phi, and the quantifier can count. There are at least five elements that are red or blue. It's the same as saying there are two red and three blue, or one red and four blue, etc. That's what I mean by basic arithmetic. De Morgan laws, I, there's no need to explain that. And what you get is uh, phi is effectively equivalent to a Boolean combination of formulas x belongs to k, or there is yeah, a certain number of elements of k that are properly uh, proper sub super words of y, proper, proper sub words of y, or incomparable with y. So you are down to these four uh, cases. And then you look into the literature on, or you recall the literature on regular languages, recall uh, K is regular, and you immediately re uh, remember that for any regular language K, the set of all proper uh, super, uh, subwords is effectively regular. Just take the automaton and play around with it a bit. And the same holds for uh, super words, and if you want to, if you want, do not want to explain it like take the automaton and play around with it, but if you want to sound more scientific, then you say the reason is that the subword relation, the proper subword relation, is a rational reduct, uh, transduction. And you have the image of K under this rational relation. But then, we hear, th this settles the second and third case. And the fourth one, this incomparability, well, um, rational relations are not closed under um, negation, complementation, and not closed under intersection. So you really have to think about it for a moment or two, or you look into the paper by Karen Dicard and Schneeblin, and they will explain to you why also incomparability under the subword relation is a rational relation. The basic idea is that, well, the first fear is that you have to check two properties at the same time. The first one is not a subword of the second and vice versa. But the basic idea is that if x is shorter than y, then y cannot be a subword of x. And that helps a lot and essentially is the uh, basis for this result. Okay, this settles the case if Q here is uh, the existential quantifier. Since then we have upward, downward closure and incomparability set. But now, now what about counting uh, things? There are at least two super words. And here the theory of weighted automata comes in handy. And with weighted automata, you can count, you can do threshold counting, just take addition, uh, sorry, uh, natural numbers with addition and 
multiplication and to have a finite semi-ring, cut it off at the threshold, uh, plus one. Uh, but in order to use it, we need that the subvert order is not only rational, since rational, yeah, you could have two paths, but it's even unambiguously rational. You can produce a transducer that has only one accepting run for a pair of word and subword. Uh, and the same holds for the incomparability relation. And then you plug it all together uh, and you get the result. And therefore, the formula phi that we started with, a quantifier followed by some Boolean combination, is effectively equivalent to some formula x in k for a certain regular language k that you can compute. And this finishes the uh, quantifier elimination. <coughs> the FO theory, FO2 theory of A star with regular predicates is decidable and the same holds with all the possible uh, counting quantifiers. I can talk about complexity. Uh, it is not, well, if you recall the proof I sketched here, the center was every partial order embeds anyway. So all you need, given a sigma one sentence, all you need to verify is whether there is a finite partial order having this property. And the size is the number of variables. And so the, uh, it's an NP, you just guess a finite partial order of the right side and you check. Uh, that is also NP complete is not mo far more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this was, despite the fact, the proof being more complicated, at the end, it's again every finite partial order embeds sufficiently often. Uh, this was the very first result, um, reduction to Pressburger arithmetic, which is elementary and therefore this proof is elementary, and the proof with quantifier elimination I sketched, uh, yeah, of course, I transformed the formula into this disjunctive normal form, whenever you do that, you get uh, non-elementary bounds, uh, but we don't know a lower bound. So the FO2 theory with regular predicates seems to be non-elementary. What if you restrict to constants? Two variable names and constants and a separate order, of course. And there's a result published this year by Karen Dikar and Schneider Lang that says, well, actually, it appears in the journal version. Uh, the original one is a couple of years older. Every FO2 formula is effectively equivalent to some quantifier-free formula we already saw this, but now you can bound the length of the, qu uh, uh, of the constants. And the constants get, well, at most doubly exponential. Sounds terrible, but it isn't. We started with non-elementary. Yeah. So you do the quantifier elimination and you end up with short constants. Double exponential constants means you have doubly exponentially many um, elementary uh, quantifiers, uh, sorry, atomic formulas. You have fourfold exponential many, uh, the, f the formula can have fourfold exponential size. And this is only if you take care of how to write it. It could also explode even more if you are not careful in doing the elimination. So anyway, how do we get these uh, short ones? Uh, we do again a quantifier elimination, but now we do not have regular predicates, but we have the constants that we can use. And the basic thing is, if you have a threshold quantifier with a quantifier, a psi quantifier free and constants of length, say, at most n, then you can build an equivalent quantifier free formula with length, uh, constants of length polynomial in n. So the quantifier elimination, when you have uh, constants but not regular predicates, every step gives a polynomial increase of the length of the constants. Uh, now, the formula Psi, 
uh, yeah, to, to explain it a bit more. So the formula Psi, here, this one, that is a Boolean combination, uh, is a Boolean combination of formulas x below y, y below x, x below w, or the other way around, where the word w has length below n, and the same with, w, uh, with y. These are the possible atomic formulas in Psi. Now, let's try to get rid of some of them. And the first one, a formula of the form x is a subword of w. w is a constant. Th that can be expressed as there is some subword disjunction, there are only finitely many anyway, subwords of w, and x is one of them. That, yeah. Now, x is the same as, w, uh, as v, is not allowed in our logic. So we have to get rid of this uh, formula again. And what we do is we say v is a subword of x, and no longer word is a subword of x. That means it's the same as saying x has the same length as v, and therefore it equals v. A stupid question, why do you, what did you know? Uh, what it is not possible to write v subword of x and x subword of uh, v? Since then, <laughs> you have this formula again. So, we introduced it, we introduced formulas x, x equals v, in particular for v equals w. So we have x equals w. And now you propose to exp uh, replace it by x below w and w below x. We could have saved a lot of time. Uh, okay, this allows us to get rid of these two atomic formulas. There's no uh, expression about superwords, but only about subwords. Constants, yeah? Uh, now again, the Morgan laws, basic arithmetic, so the usual machinery. The formula that exists at least t many y's satisfying psi is, can be written as a Boolean combination of formulas of the form w is a subword of x, and there are at least as many uh, words that are proper subwords or uh, superwords of x, and you have a Boolean combination of statements of w is below x, or uh, sorry, w is below y. Mm -hmm. That's all that's le uh, left, and the w's here uh, uh, all are, yeah, have length at most n. Now, I want to get rid of this, and what I do there is I take a set of short words, w, and I consider the set of all those words whose that all have a subword from W. Every, sub, every word of W, of capital W, is a subword of X. And X doesn't have other short subwords. And short meaning at most n. This is a, a language, and since w, a capital W is finite, it's a regular language. And uh, it allows us again, some usual messaging of formulas to get rid of the Boolean combinations and just say y belongs to LW. And the same up here, w is a sub, uh, word of x, disjunction, huge, huge disjunction of formulas x belongs to LW. Is this any better? Uh, yes, it is. Since Karen uh, Descartes and Schneeberlin showed, you can read their, pro, uh, their results as follows. Let W be such a set of uh, finite words. The following languages are quantifier free definable with constants of length n to the 2a and without formulas of the form x is a subword of W. They are not interesting anyway. Uh, this is the set of all words that have some superword in LW some subword and some incomparable word. We already knew these languages are regular, but here the result is stronger. They are not only regular, but they are definable in terms of existing and non-existing uh, subwords. And such a language is called piecewise testable. 
And the language that LW I defined was defined by saying these words are subwords and these are not. So they are also piecewise testable. And uh, the two authors used the theory and of piecewise testable languages and extended it considerably uh, and then got this result. In their paper, you will not read uh, this, th find this theorem stated like this, but in the language of logic, it is precisely this. Now, this is the existential quantifier, but we also have the threshold counting quantifier, and this is the work I'm doing together with my uh, student Schwartz. Essentially, the same result holds for the threshold counting quantifier. The only difference is that the threshold here, yeah, it of course has some influence on the constants, on the length of the constants, and they grow moderately. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, what you get is every C2 formula with constants is equivalent to some quantifier free formula with constants of a doubly exponential length and without atomic formulas of the form x is a subword of w. Then you look again into this ni very nice paper and you see a result that I find surprising. Fix your favorite m. And then take a, a, a word w. And you want to make it short without changing the set of subwords of length at most m. If m is 2, say, and you have three consecutive a's in your word, then you can safely drop one. You make it shorter. So can we do this in general? Recall that there are a to the m many words of length at most m. So if at all, then I would have hope to, short it to shorten it to a to the m. But they did it the other way around. They showed that every word has a subword of length polynomial in m that has the very same subwords of length at most m. So without uh, losing any subword of length m, you can shorten the word up to length m, polynomial in m. Okay. And then, uh, let phi of x, just one free variable, be a quantifier-free formula with constants of length at most m. The set of witnesses for phi can be accepted by some DFA of size 2 to the m to the constant. So any uh, such uh, formula has a small automaton. Now, this m, of course, comes from this theorem. It was doubly exponential. So what they get is the C2, and what we also get is the C2 theory can be decided in threefold exponential space. And if you are more careful, then uh, you see that it's uniform in, in A. You just build the automaton and you always squeeze it and you are a bit careful. Anyway, it works in threefold exponential space. Optimal? Well, we can even do a bit better. Let's, let's go back. So I go back to theorems. We knew, uh, know that we ha can build a quantifier-free formula with short uh, constants, and we know that every word has a sh small subword, short subword of the same type. And then the theory by Ferranta and Rakoff tells us that, well, if you have a, uh, encounter a quantifier, there exists a word x, and what's m uh, coming behind it says this x has some relation to y, and it's a, a superword of something, or not. Uh, then you can also use a short word. 
as witness. Therefore, we can restrict quantification to words of doubly exponential length. If you have one witness, you also find a shorter one. You're not in the counting um, it, it also works for the counting. And this is then the result, the C2 theory with constants can be decided in doubly exponential space. So we save one exponent by not building the automaton, but restricting a quantification to uh, yeah, more or less short words. And this is just to see that it's really a contrasting result. Sigma 1 theory of AB star uh, with constants is undecidable. Here we have only two variables, so it's completely different. If we have three variables, we have undecidability. And if we have regular predicates, then we get a non element. We only know a non elementary uh, procedure. I talked about uh, complexity. We have here this non elementary complexity. And what's new now is that the FO2 or the C2 theory is decidable in elementary uh, space. How much? Well, I know everybody, every speaker has to ask, uh, how much space, time do I have? Doubly exponential? No. I can ask you, yeah. It's as much as the other. Let me just show off with uh, a final result. Allow me to do that. I won't talk about the proof. I haven't prepared anyway. So, and actually, I promised to, to mention traces. So, allow me to keep my promise. Mazukevich traces. There's an obvious definition of what a subtrace is. And there's an obvious question, which of these positive results transfer to Mazakevich traces? And I'm only talking about the decidability of the C2 theory with regular predicates. M is the set of all Mazakevich traces here. And well, there are some reasons for optimism. First, well, many results on words generalize to traces, and if if you want to look up some of them, you look into this uh, book. We have a good understanding of what a regular set of traces is. That's particularly important here since we have regular predicates and we should we better understand them well. And if we have this counting quantifier, then we also need some counting. And recall, I used weighted automaton. So we would also need, if for words, we would also need them for Mazukevich traces, and also this exists. We understand that pretty well. So it's clear that it works. Now, there's this other ingredient in the proof, uh, rational relations. Subvert order is a rational relation. And you can define what rationality is, what a rational relation between trace uh, monoids is, but it doesn't preserve regularity or recognizability. Forget about it. It's a very good reason to be pessimistic. Anyway, what, what can we do? And here is the idea for the solution. Instead of regular languages and rational relations, what I use is internal logical descriptions and interpretations. By inter so I'm all, the, all the time I'm talking about logic, but I'm talking about external properties. This trace is a subtrace of, sub of that one. And now I'm considering, as Anka did, a, a trace as a graph. And I'm talking about the internal structure of the graph. As, as we do with monadic second dollar logic, that in other words, we translate external, external formulas that talk about the subtrace order into internal ones from monadic second dollar logic that talk about the, the nodes in a graph in a trace. And the theorem is, from a C2 formula with one free variable, one can construct an MSO formula, such that for all traces, we have the following. The set of traces with regular predicates satisfies the external uh, properties. So the trace T has this and that property with respect to its sub and super traces, if and only if internally it has the property Psi. Okay, and since given such a formula psi, we can decide whether there's a trace T having. We get that the C2 theory of the subtrace order with regular predicates is decidable uh, as well. I better finish. 
since I haven't prepared more. Uh, what's open is, well, we have a very particular form of regular language, frequent letters, such that the sigma-1 theory with constants gets decidable. And we have a very nice regular language, A star, where it's undecidable. It's, I have no clue where the border is between decidability and undecidability. I have not even an idea where to look. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we do have a non-elementary upper bound for the complexity of the C plus mod 2 theory with regular predicates. With constants, it was simple. With regular predicates, we don't, simply don't know. And I transferred one result from the word case to Mazurkiewicz traces, and as you saw on my tables, there are a couple of more, and if you don't remember them, then here is the table again. Thank you very much. Thank you.